Hi everyone, in this video we are going to develop a model that can be used to estimate the temperature of a planet with an atmosphere like the Earth. So I've already sketched out a diagram to show what's going on and just listed all the key parameters. So we've got a star and some distance d away from its center we've got a planet with an atmosphere. The ultimate goal uh, that we're aiming for here is to find an expression for the temperature on the surface of the planet in terms of all of the other parameters. So in particular we've said that the star uh, is a sphere with a radius of r and it has a surface temperature of t0. In terms of the planet's own parameters I've said that its atmosphere has an albedo of a. All that means is that a fraction a of the incoming solar radiation is reflected back into space. I think for a planet like the Earth that's dominated by the clouds in the atmosphere because well they're white. The atmosphere will also have an emissivity of epsilon. Epsilon is this parameter somewhere between 0 and 1 that tells you, compared with a perfect black body, how good an absorber and emitter of radiation um, the atmosphere is. You'll also notice that I've said down at the bottom here, in appropriate wavelength ranges. The reason that's important is that, well, in a simplified model, we can basically imagine that there are two different wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation that are important in this problem. Now the incoming radiation produced by the star, if it's a sun-like star, is going to peak around the visible light part of the EM spectrum, while the planet is much cooler than the star, and indeed the atmosphere of the planet is much cooler than the star, and so it's going to be emitting much longer wavelength radiation more in the infrared part of the spectrum. Now the albedo and the emissivity are in general both wavelength dependent properties, uh, because the way that substances interact with electromagnetic radiation depends on the wavelength. Um, so what we really care about is the albedo in the visible light part of the spectrum, or which, whichever part of the spectrum the light emitted by the star peaks in, while the emissivity, we specifically care about the emissivity in the infrared part of the spectrum, in other words where the planet and the atmosphere um, are emitting their radiation. So I've just drawn here a sort of uh, zoomed in view of the surface of the planet and its atmosphere which we're going to imagine exists as sort of a single layer um, somewhere above the surface. Um, I've defined some parameters, I've said the surface of the earth is at a temperature t and the radius of the Earth is going to be Re. I didn't define that originally when I stated the problem because it's going to turn out that that parameter doesn't enter into our solution. We are also going to say the atmosphere has temperature Ta and radius Ra, uh, but again those are going to turn out to cancel out and won't enter into our uh, final result. So the arrows on this diagram are sort of illustrating some of the processes um, that are going on when uh, sunlight is incident on the atmosphere and on the Earth. So you've got what I've described as short wavelength radiation coming in. That's basically the visible light from the sun. Part of that is going to be reflected when it hits the atmosphere. Um, and the fraction of light which is reflected is defined by the albedo that we mentioned earlier. Uh, the remaining visible light from the sun is going to go through the atmosphere. And in other words, it's going to be transmitted and then it's going to be absorbed by the surface. So then as the Earth or, well, the planet... Uh, starts to heat up, it's going to be emitting its own radiation. As we described earlier, uh, it's going to be of a longer wavelength than the incoming radiation because the planet is cooler than the star. Um, that emitted radiation is then going to be absorbed by the uh, atmospheric layer again and then re-radiated both away from the planet and also back down towards the surface and the portion which is re-radiated towards the surface is going to be uh, absorbed again. There are of course various simplifying assumptions that are going into this model. For example, we are pretending that the, um, the planet behaves as a perfect black body. The atmosphere doesn't, but we're pretending that the surface of the planet does. Um, in other words, it has an albedo of close to zero and an emissivity close to one. That's a pretty good approximation um, for a planet like the Earth, so that's all right. Um, we could also introduce more atmospheric layers. We pretended the entire atmosphere is just one uh, thin layer somewhere up in the sky, but we could introduce as many layers as we wanted, all of which would be in equilibrium um, with all of the other ones and refine our model that way. But the number of parameters could quickly get out of hand, so we're going to stick to this simplified model. So if you've seen my last video on the temperature of a dust grain around a star, the method for this is going to seem um, familiar, but it's just a, a more complicated model. Uh, essentially, we're going to consider the um, balance of energy energy coming in versus being emitted um, both for the surface of the planet and for the atmosphere because in thermal equilibrium the amount of energy coming in per second must be equal to the amount of energy going out per second otherwise um, our planet and its atmosphere would be either heating up or cooling down. So let's start by considering the balance of energy 
um, at the surface of the planet. And this is where the diagram that we sketched out earlier becomes pretty helpful because we can just look at the arrows on the diagram and uh, make sure we have one term in our equation corresponding to each arrow. So what about this incoming arrow, which is the portion of the um, stellar radiation which has made it through the atmosphere? So we're going to use Stefan's law um, to get the luminosity of the star and then scale that by an appropriate amount um, to get the amount of radiation which is absorbed by the surface. So the luminosity of the star is given by its surface area, 4 pi times capital R squared, times the Stefan Boltzmann constant sigma, times the fourth power of its surface temperature, t naught to the power of 4. Then we're going to have to scale that by a factor of, well, let's do the denominator first. We're going to divide it by 4 pi d squared, which is because the star is emitting radiation in all directions, and so its power is being spread over a big imaginary sphere of radius d. Um, but then the planet intercepts an amount of that radiation um, over an area equal to its own cross-section, um, and its cross-section is pi times r e squared, where I defined re to be the radius of the planet. Um, I guess I was thinking of the Earth, so I used e instead of p, but it doesn't matter. But then remember, some of that incoming radiation was reflected by the atmosphere, and so the portion that doesn't get reflected, that makes it through the atmosphere, is just 1 minus the albedo. So um, we scale our whole term by 1 minus a. So what other radiation is being absorbed by the surface of the planet, well, we've got this arrow here, which is the radiation that's been re-radiated by the atmosphere back down. Uh, that one is pretty easy to take care of. Um, we just use Stefan's law again. This time we get 4 pi radius of the atmosphere squared, again, times sigma, um, just got a different temperature, Ta, temperature of the atmosphere, to the power of 4. But then we said, remember, that the atmosphere has an emissivity not equal to 1 um, in the infrared part of the spectrum, so we just scale that by epsilon, by definition of emissivity. So that's the radiation or the power uh, coming in and being absorbed by the surface. The amount of power going out is, again, just given by Stefan's law. This time it's 4 pi radius of the Earth, or the planet, squared times sigma t to the 4, and remember t is the thing that we're ultimately trying to find in terms of everything else. Then we can just cancel 4 pi sigma from every term and end up with this slightly simplified expression that I've just written down. Now ta, the temperature of the atmosphere, was not a specified parameter of the problem, um, and so we want to get a second equation so that we can eliminate that ta to the power of 4 from our um, equation that came from energy balance at the surface. We can do that by considering the energy balance um, at the atmosphere itself. So which radiation is, well, being emitted by the atmosphere, you've got, again, we're going to use Stefan's law, 4 pi r squared, it's r a squared, radius of the atmosphere, squared, times sigma t a to the power of 4. We have to scale it by the emissivity, um, as we did before, but you've got to remember that the atmosphere is emitting its radiation both up and down, so it's effectively got two emitting surfaces, both of which have a surface area equal to 4 pi r a squared. So we just multiply that by 2 uh, to account for those two different directions that it's emitting in. And then the radiation that's being absorbed by the atmosphere is this arrow here, the long wavelength radiation that was re-emitted by the Earth. Um, that's going to be equal to 4 pi radius of the Earth squared um, sigma t of the earth to the power of 4, we have to scale that by the emissivity as well. Because again, the atmosphere is not a perfect black body, it emits and absorbs infrared radiation with an efficiency of epsilon. Then we just cancel 4 pi sigma epsilon from both sides, I've also divided by 2, and we end up with that simplified equation. So then all we do is combine our two different energy balance equations to eliminate that ra squared ta to the 4 term. So this term here that appeared in the first equation, I've just replaced it with um, half r e squared t to the 4 and ended up with this new term in my combined equation at the bottom there. So I've just had to clear some space, but I've kept the most important equation there. I'm just going to do a couple of algebraic manipulations. So two things have happened in this step. Firstly, I've cancelled the r e squared term, um, which appears in all of the individual terms. So again, interestingly, uh, within this model, um, the temperature of the Earth or planet is not going to depend on its size. And then I've also moved this term over to the right-hand side and uh, done some factorizing. And finally, you just have to get t on its own. That's going to involve some dividing and taking a fourth root. I've used the fact that a fourth root is like two square roots in a row um, to uh, write this second bit as the square root of r of d. But there is our expression for the temperature of the planet in terms of the temperature of the star. Now, it might be interesting to compare this result with the result that we got um, when we considered a planet with no atmosphere in the last video, um, we got 
t is just the square root of r over 2d times t naught. So you could, if you wanted, find the factor by which having an atmosphere um, enhances, increases the temperature of the planet. So of course you picked up this whole fourth root factor there, um, but you've also scaled up the whole thing by the square root of two, because this two on the denominator of the square root bit disappeared um, in our new expression. And then you can combine that together and say that temperature has been increased by a factor of uh, the fourth root of four minus four a um, over four minus two epsilon. In that last step, I've used the fact that the square root of two is the same as the fourth root of four. So for example, uh, if we consider our atmosphere to be a perfect greenhouse, which lets through all of the stellar radiation, um, in other words, it has an albedo of zero, um, and then re-radiates all of the outgoing radiation as efficiently as possible. In other words, it has an emissivity of one. Uh, this factor just reduces to the fourth root of two. If you then increase the albedo, you increase A, then you're decreasing your numerator. And so you're decreasing that temperature enhancement factor, which makes sense because the bigger A is, the more of the incoming power is being reflected straight back into space. What about epsilon? Well, if you make epsilon smaller and smaller, start with one and you keep making it smaller, um, then you are subtracting off less stuff on the bottom. So you're making the denominator bigger. If the denominator gets bigger, then your enhancement factor is going to get smaller. And so that's telling you that um, the less efficient at re-radiating your atmosphere is, the smaller the temperature enhancement factor is going to become. Um, and again, that makes sense, consistent with our physical expectations. Okay, I think that's enough for this video. Thank you for watching and see you next time.